The thing that I'm most curious about is how you became interested or involved in ecumenism so long ago. If it was a particular person or a moment in your life where you came to see the church differently? I couldn't, I couldn't remember just some precise moment. I think it goes back to my student days, really, that uh, I studied at the University of Glasgow and we had clergy and lay people from different denominations, both from the Protestant churches and from the Roman Catholic Church, who came and addressed the students from time to time. And some of them were very keen on the notion of a closer integration of the churches. And I think at that time I began to think to myself, well, this is a good thing that they are advocating. And when was that about, as far as time? Oh, well, we're talking now about back in the 1930s and 40s. <laughs> we're talking about a long time ago. <laughs> I was in university from 1936 onwards. <laughs> so we're talking about uh, the period actually before the Second World War. Uh huh. Between the wars. Yeah, between the wars. Your professors were pretty advanced. I think, I think indeed we were. I was writing a book two or three years ago, and uh, I mentioned in the preface that we not only were taught to look at other forms of Christianity, but in our seminary schedule at Glasgow at that time, you could take courses in non-Christian religions. Really? In fact, I took courses in both Islam and Buddhism. And it wasn't just a case of looking at them from the outside. We had teachers who had... Who knew? Who lived with these people and had learned the languages. We had... Uh, one man on Islam who had lived in Arabia for many years and of course he spoke Arabic and he gave courses in Arabic as well as teaching. In Glasgow in the Islam. 30s, that would surprise people. And we had another very old man he was at that time who had in his youth learned the Pali language, which is that of the most ancient Buddhist scriptures. Oh. Pali is oh, a, Pali. A, form yes. of, I, a form the, of Sanskrit, the, yeah, so a popular I, kind of Sanskrit. And he had been into all that and was able to get people interested. So, as I say, we were not only trying to learn something about religions other than the rather, uh, shall we say, narrow variety that you could find in Scotland in those days. <laughs> also, we were learning something about uh, non-Christian religions. Mm -hmm. That's become very fashionable recently. Right. But in those days, yeah. it was very unusual. Why do you think it was the case there? Do you think there was some um, leadership, even maybe during the First World War, that gave a... Well, that's possible. That was before my time, of course. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes people think I've been in the First World War, and so <laughs> ancient, but actually I was born in 1919, which was the year after it finished. But certainly at that time there must have been stirrings. And of course, there was an American philosopher whose name just escapes me at the moment. I could find it uh, before you go away if you want. But uh, he was very interested back, I would say, must have been teaching in the 1890s. Huh. He was very interested in getting Christians to learn about non-Christian religions. Right. And he taught a doctrine of what he called reconception. 
uh-huh. meaning that when you came in touch with some new system of belief, you find yourself rethinking mm-hmm. some of the things in your own mm-hmm. and really establishing a kind of dialogue in mm-hmm. which there's both mm-hmm. a giving and a taking. Mm-hmm. And uh, all that certainly impressed me quite a bit.